Arctic Monkeys is a band that earned their fame before they even released their first album. They managed to experiment with heavy garage rock, pop rock, punk, and more while still keeping their sound congruent across their five albums. They've also stayed incredibly relevant in mainstream music, despite of the fall in rock music's popularity. Let's take a closer look at how they managed to do this. Arctic Monkeys is a band that was formed in High Green Sheffield in England in 2002. The founding members Alex Turner, Matt Helders, Jamie Cook and Annie Nicholson started out as a band that was inspired by their local peers to play music. The Sheffield music scene was filled with other bands that played guitar music at the time, and the guys decided to start their own. They eventually started practicing in Yellow Arch Studios in Neepsend and played their first ever gig in June of 2003 at their local pub, The Grapes. Later that year, they released a demo CD with 18 songs. It was a demo that the band gave away for free at their concerts initially to spread more awareness of them. Thanks to their willingness to give away their music for free, many initial fans uploaded their music to the internet. And from there, their music continued to be shared and spread all around the world. This demo was to be known by the name Beneath the Boardwalk because when the first sender received a batch of the CDs, he didn't have any name to classify them with. So he simply named them after the place he received them, quote, beneath the boardwalk. This led to a lot of people falsely believing that beneath the boardwalk was the actual title. And sometimes people believe that it was their first full length album. But before their debut album, they actually issued a limited single release and also played a famously remembered gig at the Reading and Leeds Festival. They played at a very small stage called the Carling Stage, and because their reputation had grown so immensely during the past years, an unusually large crowd came to watch them. Later on, as the band signed to Domino Records in June of 2005, they decided to start working on their first album. Later that year, they were offered some pretty good deals with other record labels, such as EMI and Epic Records, but the guys decided to stay true to Domino because they liked Lawrence Bell, the owner of the label's down-to-earth approach to running the business. On the 23rd of January in 2006, their debut album, Whatever People Say I Am, That's What I'm Not, was released. And it was released to a huge wave of fans. It turned out to be the fastest selling debut album in British music history, shifting over 360,000 copies during its first week. In retrospect, a lot of people refer to this as a concept album. Many of the songs are about being young, going out, being with girls, getting drunk, and living all of those experiences surrounding that lifestyle. All the songs play out as observations made by the frontman and vocalist Alex Turner. It doesn't matter if it's a limousine full of dressed up girls. A bleak reference to his own music scene. Or his intimate and romantic memories. Laughs and jokes around. Remember cuddles in the kitchen, yeah, to get things up the ground. No matter what he thinks about, it seems like Alex Turner has this thing for putting things straight. He simply thinks about what he feels, thinks, and the experiences he's had. 
and he comes across as a very transparent and smart singer and lyricist. Keeping their work ethic together, the band quickly released an EP just a few months after the release of their debut album, Who the Fuck Are the Arctic Monkeys? Some people have criticized the band for releasing the EP so fast, calling it money grabbing and cashing in on their success. But the guys simply found touring to be quite boring, so they wanted some time in between to be creative, and this is the result. Now, before they started touring North America, bassist Ann Nicholson decided to take a break from the band because of fatigue. He's also stated that the fame was a bit overwhelming for him, so he later decided to quit the band, and then he was later replaced by Nick O'Malley. <laughs> Then on the 23rd of April 2007, they released their second full-length album, Favorite Worst Nightmare. This was yet another major success for the band, but in terms of sound, it was a bit different compared to their debut. The music publication Uncut said that the album was more ambitious, heavier, and with a fiercely bright production. You can certainly hear the heaviness of this album during the opening track, Brian Storm. Drummer Matt Helders said, quote, James was DJing loads in the evening, so we would go out and have a dance, end quote. As a result of being inspired by the DJing, the drum rhythms of Helders have drawn comparisons to 80s funk band ESG. Apparently, a lot of fans think the drumming on this album was one of the more outstanding things to it. But in my opinion, this is not the only outstanding thing. For example, the band's love for classic films also influenced their new style on this album too. For example, the organ at the beginning of the album's final track, 505, is directly taken from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Two can take a lot quicker than one. After releasing and touring their second album, the band went on a short hiatus. But they quickly went back to writing new material in 2008. 24 new songs made up the base for their third album. 12 of these songs were recorded in Rancho de la Luna in Los Angeles with the help of Queens of the Stone Age frontman Josh Homme. And the next year they recorded the next 12 songs in New York together with James Ford. But only 10 of all of these songs actually made it onto the album. On ClashMusic.com, writer Simon Harper praised Turner's songwriting skills by writing, quote, Turner is his usual eloquent self, but has definitely graduated into an incomparable writer whose themes twist and turn through stories and allegories so potent and profound it actually leaves one breathless. Your pastimes consisted of the strange and twisted and deranged and I love that little game you had called crying lightning Humbug was released in late 2009 and went straight to the top of the UK album charts, just like the band's previous albums. And the advancement of drum based music on their second album was just one of many steps they would take forward. On Humbug, they make use of the baritone, slide guitars, and percussional instruments such as xylophone, glockenspiels, and shakers. You can also find keyboards on almost every song on the album. Again, this is an album where they actually expand in terms of what instruments they wanted to use. But the instruments was just the beginning. Stylistically speaking, Humbug has been noted for having some of their heaviest music on it. Pretty Visitors is a good example of a very heavy song, 
Alex Turner has also later confessed that he's inspired by rap music, and it also sounds like he's dropping a few bars near the end of that song. Just listen. The album is definitely slower in tempo compared to their previous albums, and utilizes guitar effects that make them sound quite different from what they made before. In an NMA article, Mike Williams writes, quote, If Arctic Monkeys had never walked into the desert with Josh Homme to record Humbug in 2009, they could have never made AM. Humbug was as much about subverting people's impressions of who the band were as it was an album in its own right. Now, after the Humbug tour, the band was once again ready to craft another record. Again, they decided to collaborate with James Ford as their producer and recorded the album in the famous Sound City Studios in LA in 2010 and 11. The album was named Suck It and See, and was released during the summer of 2011. This was yet another historical moment for the band, because it was their fourth record in a row to reach number one on the album charts. About the album's sound, drummer Matt Hellers said, Some of the songs are a bit more instant, he explained. A bit more poppy, certainly, than Humbug was. It's enjoyable for us and the listener, and it's a bit more easygoing. Not easy listening, but with a few poppier tunes, but in an interesting way. According to the band, the album takes inspiration from Johnny Cash, George Jones, and Patsy Cline, amongst others. Their recording and creative process for this album was quite different from some of their previous ones. Instead of going into the studio with unfinished songs and relying on overdubbing, much of the material was rehearsed and finished before recording it. The band recorded many of the songs live and focused on using as little overdubs as possible. So this time we tried to take a bit of time before we actually went into like a studio to record. So everyone knew what we were doing. So this mostly, in fact, all the tunes we've been recording have just been like live takes. Now, a fun fact about the release of this record, in some stores in the US, the title on the front of the album was covered with a big sticker. This was a censorship that was applied because many Americans interpreted the expression suck it and see in a much more vulgar way. It's actually an English expression that means that you should try something before you judge it. Brick by brick. Now finally, let's talk about their fifth studio album, AM. It saw the band taking their sound in a new direction once again. You might not be surprised to hear that this album too peaked in the UK charts and became a huge commercial success, helping the band to conquer new grounds in mainstream music. About the title of the album, Alex said, quote, I actually stole it from the Velvet Underground. I'll just confess that now and get it out of the way the VU record, obviously. Turner later revealed that the band had originally planned to call the album The New Black after a guitar amp that used during the recording process. But since he felt like AM, which stands for Arctic Monkeys, obviously, fit better for the occasion, they went for that instead. When starting to create ideas for AM, they would set up rehearsals in LA's Sage and Sound studios, and use a 4-track cassette recorder to record their ideas on to begin with. Then, when producer James Ford hit the studio, they dropped the cassette recorder, used some of the ideas they had already recorded as they were, and made modifications to others. For a long time, the band lived by the ethos that they should easily be able to play the songs live right after recording them, and would therefore record the songs similarly to how they would perform them. 
But as for the production of this record, they threw that mentality away. Quote, We thought it more important to make a good sounding record than hold on to the idea that we should have to be able to play it live. As a result, there was more overdubbing involved, and they would usually start recording the bass and drums to begin with to get the groove and rhythm just right. They would also experiment with the setup of Helder's drum kit, setting it up in unconventional ways, and about the drums, Helder said, On other songs, I would play kick drum for a take, then add some snare to try to get an isolated sound. I found the challenge of playing an effect on a drum kit interesting. I didn't understand the appeal of trying to sound like a machine, like Questlove from The Roots, when I first started playing the drums, but I get it a bit more now. Queens of the Stone Age frontman Josh Homme once again collaborated with the band on their song Knee Socks. About working with Josh, Alex said, quote, He came down and sort of got us out of a little rut. It's fun, it's friends, extended family now. They came around, had a fun night. His contribution to the record is really exciting. It's probably my favorite. The 30 seconds that he's in, there is just I don't know, it's something that I've never heard before. Not to blow my own trumpet or anything, but you know what I'm saying. The album also features guest appearances from Pete Thomas, who's known for being the drummer for Elvis Costello, and we also find Bill Ryder Jones on the album, who's famous for being the co-founder of The Coral, and is also a part of Turner's other band, The Last Shadow Puppets. This is also an album that has been cited for a range of different influences. You can find traces from psychedelic rock, blues rock, R&B, soul, and even some hip-hop in here. Now looking back at the years when they started playing in 2002 and up until today, we can see that the band has been through numerous changes. Alex Turner's singing style is a great example of this. In the beginning, he went for a very raw, fast, and unhinged style, and as time passed by, he started singing cleaner, with a different accent, and with a more laid-back cadence. Let's have a game on a teddy picker, not quick enough, can I have it quicker? Already figured he gets him thicker. Secondly, they brought in new elements in their music. Starting out, they played very fast and heavy music inspired by garage rock, post-punk and indie rock. Then their music took on elements of desert and stoner rock, and later they sprinkled some pop on top of that. But their gradual change doesn't only appear in their music though. In later years, the band also seemed to be more aware of their style, and Alex Turner, for example, incorporated a 50s fashion style with the elephant's trunk hairdo and the leather jacket. And in 2013, he stated himself that, quote, there's something about the 50s look that feels futuristic. It just protrudes forward. The teaser video for their new album, Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino, is also taking inspiration from the past, but rather from the 70s aesthetic of a futuristic looking hotel. No matter what their new music is going to sound like, it sure is an exciting time for a band that so far has been at the peak of rock music for the past two decades. Alright, so that's the video for today, guys. I just want to give an extra thanks to all of my Patreons. Thank you so much for supporting me and helping me create better videos. And if you want to support me as well, make sure you click the first link in the description below. Also, a big shout out to Volksgeist. This is a friend of mine who's running another channel and he recently made a video about AM. So if you want to know more about that specific Arctic Monkeys album, then make sure you click the second link below. And there's also a link in the comments if you want to check it out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you later.